Okay, friends, well, remember, only those who come tonight will be initiated. You know that. Nick, Nixus will see to that. You know, we're climbing the mountain, we're ascending, and, uh, but you'll have to wait for that. It'll still be another 45 minutes away. Hold on. Okay, now, um, shall we shut some doors here and so forth? Yes, Gloria, that's fine. Just close the door, come on right in. Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Kabaska from Boston. Peter has been in this field low these many years. And by the way, if, if all works out tomorrow and there's enough space in the next room, we'll have a dance. Do you like to dance? Peter leads marvelous folk dances. So hopefully, if you have a little, little spare energy left, and want to shake a leg, we'll be in the next room to do that. But tonight he's going to speak about uh, Mars, Neptune, and the relationship to Venus. Now, you have to listen carefully because Peter has a lot of Gemini and Virgo. So that means there will be lots of details. So listen attentively, okay? And then you can be initiated within the hour. Are, what, it's not working? Do you want to have a plug-in? Uh, what's going on here? I've never had such a tech, technological haywire day. What, what Mercury? Uranus and Mercury. That's right, Uranus and Mercury. That's it. Oh, what do you know? <laughs> it's on my midheaven, exactly. <laughs> yeah, are you good, Peter? All right. I just have to get... Okay. See where I enjoy. No, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> I did have a curse. Yeah. Oh, uh, the cursor disappeared again. Um, but it looks like it's on its way. I might as well uh, hand out this copy too. I'll put one on each side. Uh, this is Venus uh, from the point of view of Earth the Venus cycle of eight years. And um, I might as well just give you the color copy because they're nicer. Uh, and mostly I deal with it from the sun's point of view and they're more of a geometric pattern. Um, it doesn't want to cooperate. Well, maybe I need to be closer to this. That's, oh. There we are. Or, here we were. There. Okay. Ooh, yes. Sorry. Navigate. One. What the heck is that? There we go. Okay. Okay. What happened to the other ones? What is this? Oh, I see. It's all bunched up into three here. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, well, here's the handout. Uh, the whole point of heliocosms uh, and of these cycles that I study, they're, uh, they're conjunctions and oppositions with the sun in the case of Mars, and they're conjunctions with the sun, with Mercury and Venus, that are either direct or retrograde conjunctions, and they form geometric uh, patterns in the sky. So, uh, yeah, I wish I had a point. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, this would be Mercury. It's a six-pointed star that revolves uh, continuously more rapidly than the others. Venus is the most, say, perfect form. It forms a five-pointed star. This is from the Sun's point of view. The Venus uh, chart that I handed out is from the Earth's point of view. So every little line on that drawing is a day, uh, and it's. Uh, it forms that rosette over eight years. The pink one on the bottom is uh, just one cycle of nine months, and it forms a heart shape. But from the point of view of the sun, it creates a geometric form, which is a five-pointed star. What this means is, well, let's see. Uh, it'll conjunct in once. The, would say if this is the Earth on the outer rim, it'll conjunct retrograde next to the Earth. And then it'll switch over, uh, go through its orbit, and then conjunct on the opposite side of the Earth. The Earth would be here, and that would be the second conjunction. So it alternates between direct and retrograde conjunctions, but if over, well, I guess I have a 32-year cycle, four full cycles. The Mars helicosm from the sun looks like this. It's jagged. It's an uneven uh, eight-sided star. The Grand Trigon the, has 39 or 40 steps. Uh, as it goes around. This is the period from 1425 to 2200. Uh, so about 750 years, 775 in this case. So, uh, oh yes, I, thank you very much. The Grand Trigon is a conjunction of, of, Saturn, and Mar of Saturn and Jupiter. It happens every two, 20 years. It's a generational cycle, but it forms a triangle. Uh, each of these is a triangle, just shifting over uh, and revolving over, in this case, uh, 750 years. The, the triangle uh, takes 60 years. The Chinese actually have a festival uh, that where they worship the, or they invoke the North Star. Oh, thank you. Yes, I better put in this up, I think. Um, every 60 years, and they set up elaborate uh, ceremony for it. Uh, 20 years. It, it conjuncts every 20 years and then opposes in between. And then uh, after, you know, and another, in, after say 10 years it opposes, and then 20 years it conjuncts again. And in 60 years it forms a triangle in the sky. It goes through the uh, four elements, each um, taking about 200 years, let's say. Here's the Venus heliocosm again. The method I used in the, uh, the Venus diary is basically uh, it, it hits an arm every nine months. So that nine-month period after it hits the sign, or perhaps, it depends on the chart. I'm not a real fan of extreme precision in terms of degree and all the rest. I think what's most important is to see in the chart what, how the person responds. Or do they sit back? Uh, this is usually...
Venus and Mercury in either in front of the sun, which means a rapid response, or rising behind the sun. Uh, and that's, that's quite useful. Also, you need to look at the chart and, and figure out, do they have resistance to uh, responding to things? Do they like to take their time? Are they reflective or are they very impulsive or action-oriented? So uh, all of those things, I think, are much more important in this cycle research than they would be in a uh, traditional an or orthodox chart where you need to have exactitude. So here I suggest that uh, people set up a table. I have uh, some tables here, uh, but they're basically uh, the four, the five signs across with tabulations underneath where you can fill in events in your life. If you do it over a series of uh, five or six cycles, you begin to see that the same things a lot of the same things occur under a sign and under a particular arm. And that means it's uh, in, the, in a person's lifetime, usually these signs will remain in the same place. It, uh, one or two arms may change in a lifetime, in a 100-year period, 80, 100-year period. So you're left with, uh, with this, this set of signs. Uh, you can, once you've set up your own events, your own personal events, your, uh, your individual experience, you can assign keynotes to what that experience was. Then the next step I would suggest is to basically assign goal phrases once you see how you react to it. Some you're going to react sort of strangely to or negatively. Some will be blank. Some will be very positive. In my case, I, a lot of deaths happen in Aries, uh, in the Aries arm. And so I, uh, at, at the same time, it brings very high experiences and, and any number of other things. But you have to find out for yourself what it would do. And this is basically the impact of uh, Venus on the signs that are active and stimulating the Earth at this particular century. So uh, going further down, Mars has a similar uh, set of patterns. It creates a floret. One is viewed from the Earth. These are oppositions. And it creates a geometric pattern when viewed from the Sun. When you're just putting the uh, points. Both are points in a 360 degree wheel. But one tends to look like a flower. And you can imagine, if you've studied astronomy, historical astronomy, that the uh, pre-Copernican astrology or the pre- Sun-centered astrology used a great number of uh, elaborate florets and epicycles and all the rest. You can see why uh, that might be suggested to the mind of an astronomer 500 or 1,000 years ago. Uh, each of these, the point of the heliocosm is that they, because they're lined up with the sun, they're both heliocentric and they're both geocentric at the same time. You only deal with conjunctions or oppositions. So basically, I looked at the planets, uh, the planetary positions as uh, solarized, energized by the sun a lot more than the positions in the planet, it's in the chart itself. So I'll put a glyph, uh, five, five points out, say for, say for Venus, five points outside the ring of the chart, uh, two positions each, and see if they conjunct any planets. I just discovered in going over this group that um, uh, something new, which is that one person had, uh, I've only seen one chart, I think, with four or five uh, positions hitting a planet within uh, zero to three degrees orb. That's what I allow. And I'll allow another degree if there's a stellium or whatever else is involved. It's a strength, a, a very strong position. But in this case, I looked at the, I said, well, there doesn't seem to be any relationship at all. And then I realized four of the five points were exactly opposite a planet, almost to the degree, within one degree or zero degrees. And so now I have another project on my hand, which is to figure out what this means. Uh, it's going to be interesting. With Venus, I feel uh, it provides opportunities for the soul to enter in and for soul energy to 
to give you an added impetus. You can use the positions of Venus also as, a, um, as transits. So you establish them before birth to get an idea of uh, how all the planets in the chart are qualified by Venus or Venusian energy. You can do the same with Mars, with Jupiter. You can do it with Saturn too, I do that very rarely. I do it with the Trigon. And these all have different significances. Mars represents uh, challenges. Here's a sort of an abbreviated version of how I look at the three aspects of the mind. Uh, Mercury associated with Manasa Divas and basically pure intuition, uh, the Antakarana. Venus with uh, the solar Agnishvatas and the uh, and with booty, love, wisdom, head, heart, mind. Um, Mars are the lunar Manasa Putras, it's the sons of mind, inherited from the previous solar system associated with the mental unit. And they represent concrete mind and social evolution, I'd say, too. Uh, Mars uh, is a bit further down, I think I have the, uh, I'll actually put this in context. Uh, there's something called the long body of the solar system. The sun itself is moving north towards Capricorn and Vega. It's dragging all the planets with it. We just see a disk because we're little midges, basically. And we, <laughs> we don't have the perspective of living a thousand years and seeing, uh, seeing things in spiral cyclic form in a large way. So here, if this were the orbit of Pluto on the outside, 250 years. In 250 years, all these inner planets are spiraling around a lot more quickly. When you look at it, it looks like a spirilla in the esoteric atom up here, from my point of view, anyway. The, uh, I look at it in terms of 250-year cycles because five of the planets have, uh, they coordinate with each other in terms of 250 years. Over the last 4,000 years, I've looked at them. Uh, the last 2,000 years, they're quite tight. Uh, and this is in an analyzing uh, nations. Uh, here we have just the other. The now, with Mars and Neptune, uh, Mars is concrete. It's based on uh, force rather than energy or rays. You can divide energy into rays. Rays demand alignment. Energy comes from within. Force is associated with the form or the shell. And it's associated with life, uh, with concrete life on Earth. Uh, that's Mars. Uh, Mars and Neptune rule the solar plexus, the animal brain. Mars rules basically the animal nature, the lower aspect of all the three aspects of the personality. The brain, the, uh, the, the phys as the physical, the emotional, and the mental uh, components of our personality. Neptune is pure energy. That's why it's so, it's, people who work with uh, energy work or, or dowsers and uh, people who use energy for healing are more familiar with this. Uh, I've had limited experience, but I have quite a number of friends who work with it, and I, the few experiences I've had with them have been more than I expected would, uh, could occur. Uh, energy work is quite amazing, and it takes a particular Neptunian type of uh, tuned person, I think. Uh, Mars uh, deals with the instincts as well. Uh, what we want is to find some way of using Mars positively so it serves the interest of Venus and also of Jupiter. Jupiter, uh, let me switch to that graphic. Jupiter, Neptune, and Venus I see as, oh, here we are. I'm sorry, I, my eyesight's not so great. I see as uh, related to the soul. They also related to the second initiation, which is interesting. But they're all involved in the soul and theosophy in terms of 
ancient cycles and the planets that brought the soul into being. The tonic flames are kept in Neptune. Uh, Jupiter and Venus formed a triangle with the Earth, which almost uh, destroyed life on the moon. There's uh, all kinds of interesting passages on these three planets in relationship to the soul. Uh, with Jupiter, it's, a, it's more or less the chart form. It's a, uh, there are 12 conjunctions or 11. It depends. I've written a book on it, so I can give you details through that. But here, in this case, in 1975, uh, say we start a cycle in 1975. It starts here, goes down to 1976, goes around, and it comes back to the same same point, more or less, a little f uh, a little short, uh, and it's 1987. I don't know if any of you have noticed an extraordinary number of organizations, musical groups of, uh, of very high quality, all kinds of things uh, starting in 1987. The Tibetan community has an immense number of initiatives in 87. Uh, so I thought that would be a good illustration for Jupiter. Jupiter is, um, it works with Venus in uh, terms of, if you look at Saturn as being the ring pass not of, uh, of your limitation, your structural limitation, and the ability to maintain life and uh, your, your existence by observing limits and laws and, uh, and uh, the brick walls against which you collide, uh, then Jupiter is the ring pass knot of your radiation. It's, it's the extent to which you can radiate and basically create a sphere of uh, influence, a sphere of uh, cooperation. You draw people, factors, all kinds of situations into your environment through, through Jupiter. But it, it depends on the extent and the intensity of your radiation. And then you can work creatively with, with the, for those factors within Jupiter. So Jupiter, to me, is very re re much related to Venus. But it's more, it's more where Saturn would be a, a builder, Jupiter is a creative worker. It's more, uh, uh, if you say, con creative. Uh, Synthesis, of course, it rules the cardinal cross, which is the cross of synthesis. Uh, Saturn rules the fixed cross of crisis, and um, it's the cross that uh, disciples face in terms of initiation. But the cardinal cross, I mean, the uh, cardinal cross, Bailey said, would be the key to understanding uh, the crosses, because you'd have very low types and you have very high types in the cardinal cross, very few high types, I imagine, and very many low types. And uh, this would probably be re reflected by, say, 50% of the population almost all, all over the world, which is unthinking. They live on hand-me-down thoughts or congealed, what, what you call attitudes, opinions, congealed thought forms, congealed attitudes, congealed emotional states. So it's very important to distinguish between all these factors, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. And let's see. Uh, oops, uh, I really can't see where I there. So, just a brief overview of the instincts. Uh, fear is the base of all the five instincts, animal instincts, through the solar plexus, Neptune and Mars. Fear poisons, love heals. Uh, you have the self-perpetuation and survival instinct, the sex instinct, which is basically the, if it's horizontal, it's horizontal. If it's vertical, it's the, it's the sexual relationship of the soul with the physical body, taking incarnation. Uh, and it has, it has a mystical effect, I think, on, uh, in terms of union, uh, the sense of union. What do I say up here? Uh, uh, no, I didn't say it there. I said somewhere else. Well, at any rate, it gives it gives some it gives some people just the ability to lose themselves entirely for even a few seconds. They become egoless because of a state of bliss. 
And for advanced people, I think it's a way of refining the nervous system, refining uh, one's entire physical nature. It's rejuvenating, self-resurrecting, it's uh, mutually resurrecting, etc. Spirit instinct. Uh, we have, um, I was hoping I'd be able to read some of this, but I'm not having much luck. Uh, hurting and conformity give the sense, the, the sense and the feeling that you're safe and secure in a large group, uh, but that's not necessarily the case nowadays. And, and the sort of interesting uh, uh, adjunct to that is the an anonymity in the cities, which also gives you a sense of security to some extent. Uh, Self-assertion, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, it expresses particularly through the ambitious animals of Scorpio, Sag, Cap, and uh, the very social Aquarius. I'd add, I'd add Aquarius. Uh, inquiry, you need to know what's coming ahead. You uh, want to know, sniff out the situation ahead of time. Uh, and those are the five instincts which are transmuted into their higher correspondences through Venus. Mars engagement in contact, contact through collision, through formal social rituals, etc. Uh, Mars and courage, what are the drivers? Idiocy, sheer obliviousness, desire for feudal rewards of loot or land, let's see, uh, from lack of analytic, analytic capacity, or from a sense of duty, or a sense of real duty uh, of conscious living ethics, uh, determination for self-improvement, will of self-possession, warmth of heart, will to do good. Um, Mars nobility, that's why Mars is can, can be associated with nobility because of its, its self-sacrifice and its association with Neptune. Of course, it's, they interact. Mars is deeply re related to idealism uh, rather than to ideas, uh, but it is the energy uh, on all the personality levels that uh, drive one into one's ideals and choose. Well, you know, sacrifice, you can look at sacrifice two ways. One side of it is sacrifice, the other side is free will choice. If you make a free will choice, you've just annihilated a whole bunch of opportunities. Of, of You've sacrificed everything else if you're one-pointed, or at any time you make a choice. Uh, sacrifice on the other side. Uh, you can sacrifice yourself in a day, or in a, hor in a horrible torture situation, or you can sacrifice yourself over an 80 or 90 year life, uh, life cycle. And the choice is yours. That's Agni Yoga and its attitude. I, I appreciate it a lot. Mars, uh, Ray 3 expresses through Saturn, Mars, and Earth. So I find that Mars, uh, particularly in the writing of this book on Mars, uh, I had a two-week period of, of absolute blockage, and I don't usually have it to this intense degree. Then I realized, okay, this is probably dealing with my personal issues. I have Moon, Mars, and Virgo in the eighth house. And I have enough Mercury already with Sun, Uranus, and Gemini. So there's, I'd never noticed it, that they're sort of applying, uh, it's an applying square. It, I never noticed that all these years. I have no idea. I must have blocked it out. But anyway, so it's been getting worse as I get older and <laughs> I'm, I'm having lots of fun with it as much as I can. But here, it, I look at Mars as sort of the dragon of the resistance on the, and this is relates to the soul, mind, and brain. Uh, there's a reptilian brain, you know, the little dragon. Uh, it's extremely resistant to change and, and whatnot. Uh, you have the animal brain, the mammalian brain. It's extremely protective of its progeny, fight or flight, uh, of its own uh, self-survival. You have the human brain. I like to call it the medusa, the snake pit of the lower mind, uh, the paralyzing gaze of uh, chitter chatter you know, going on, and I, I, should I do this? Oh, I'll make a list. Uh, that'll help. Uh, oh, the list is 10 pages long. I still can't make a decision. I'm in agony. <laughs> What's going to, you know, what is going 
to resolve this. Well, that, this is where Mars and the subconscious mind come in. The, uh, the human animal brain exhibits highly adaptive instinct in relationship to the autonomic or unconscious use of speech, of grammar, vocabulary. You don't have to think about speaking in your language. You just speak. And uh, this is a high animal function. All animals have a form of speech. The human uh, speech is rather complex and abstract and conceptual. Um, it allows the assessment uh, and analysis of associations, causal relations, knowledge, and an automatic adaptation to the listening and learning styles of others. So this is all good stuff with Mars uh, and the subconscious mind. Mars rules the subconscious mind to a great extent. The subconscious mind I would divide into three categories. The fourth house uh, related to genetic subconscious. The eighth house related to the personal subconscious, wh which is why it's associated so, so much with fear. And then the twelfth house with the collective unconscious. And I've uh, been thinking about it, in looking at it in terms of ignorance. Some of the Hindu schools identify chitta with ignorance because it's just uh, mental substance. It's not being used by the triad necessarily. If you're uh, operating ex exclusively on the mental plane, you're dealing with mental substance. It needs something higher, a soul or uh, some sort of structured form, the mental unit, any number of things or habits, anything to organize it and structure it. So, uh, the interesting thing about, I think it's uh, important to sort of remain in touch with the um, subconscious as much as one can. Uh, my, my teacher was Isabel Hickey in Boston. She had um, a healing meditation every week at uh, March Chapel, where Martin Luther King uh, used to have his prayer meditations. And uh, we would get together about 60 people or so. and. Uh, I would talk for half an hour, create a pool of healing light, and then dunk people into it, uh, either calling out their names or just silently invoking them. And uh, people would bring their difficulties to the group. It was really rather nice. She, she was a, an astrologer who had stu studied Bailey, but she felt that uh, esoteric astrology had not been created yet, and we had a w long way to go. And she advised young astrologers that you either need hi, uh, to distinguish between lower and higher psychism, use your higher psychism through the heart instead of the solar plexus, the animal brain, and or use your intuition through the head centers, and you would you would function very well as an astrologer uh, during the interim period, the transition period. Uh, the interesting thing about this, she would suggest actually giving a name to your subconscious. So you establish a relationship. It's not like a dissociative, uh, you know, you're in, uh, you have multiple personalities or you, you're broken them to uh, in disintegrated parts. Uh, but if you give your subconscious a name, you have a way of invoking and drawing your mind into that dimension of your mind, the animal mind. That, there are two aspects of the animal mind, it, uh, and all the aspects of the brain. On the subconscious level, it perceives a hundred times or a thousand times of what we, we can perceive with our filtering intellectual apparatus or with our habit patterns as egos, as sun, uh, represented by the sun. It's a filtering mechanism. It allows us to see some things and it definitely keeps us from seeing other things for any number of psychological reasons. But here, uh, the important thing, this is associated particularly with cancers because Cancers have to move directly from instinct straight up through intuition without the benefit of analyzing intellect in between. That's a chore that cancers have. And it's, uh, it's almost unimaginable to me until I started thinking about the subconscious and how it works. And uh, the interesting thing about this subconscious, subconscious can relay both instinct and intuition. Uh, and there's a value in a proactive approach, which you might want to just get in touch with your subconscious in any way you want to. People do it through dowsing, tarot, through divinations of various types. 
but you might even be able to have a much more direct uh, relation through meditation. But at any rate, uh, the important thing to remember is that it's giving you, it's can, it it's, can either be a dragon of resistance and say, okay, you've been, you have your career and your schedule and your program. Did you consult me? No, you didn't. I'm going to stop you in your tracks. You're having an accident. Or I'm going to make you sick. I'm going to make, I'm going to wear you out so much, your nerves are going to break down. So uh, it has that capacity. It also has the capacity, you know, to, if you develop a relationship, a dialogue with it, you can sort of encourage it to participate in what you want to do. You know, you can ask what its needs are. No, my Dowser friends are particularly interested in this. They want to know, well, what's the best way of approaching this situation, uh, and what do you, what is going to help you participate? You, you, me, my lower nature participate in this project that I have on on a Venus or a Mercury level. So with a relationship, you basically turn the subconscious mind into a mechanism of response. Uh, it's a, it, turns the, it transforms the brain so that it becomes a more uh, effective mechanism of response for uh, receiving higher uh, impressions. I think this is really true. It's the sort of the right use of Mars, uh, the Mars mind. There are any number of issues that come up with Mars. Um, Mars is memory and anim human animal brain. Uh, it's related to the mental unit. The mental unit is governed by Libra, uh, in which the uh, that's the sign in which the wheel is reversed uh, through Taurus and Libra. Taurus and Scorpio are very important because they are the horizontal arm of the fixed cross. And I've noticed in nations as well as in people that all the basic lessons get learned in this Taurus-Scorpio axis. Uh, more spiritual lessons get uh, learned with identity and group relations, group consciousness relations uh, with Leo and Aquarius. So this is a factor. Mars and learning. Are you actually getting a human education, uh, learning how to think? Or are you getting an animal training, and even in technical fields, uh, that I would call rank intellect or technical intellect. It's not in intelligence. Intelligence is head heart. It's a Venus mind. In intelligence has to have the heart and the, the head unified. I, wouldn't, I would not call Mars mind, the concrete mind, that you find in science. Now, science has uh, a huge spectrum of, uh, of, of people in terms of their development, their focus, and what, whatnot. But you can find in almost any community, academic community, that there is, uh, they're extremely attached to their, their ideas and their little pet projects, etc. So there's a real astral quality to the rank, what I call rank intellect. Um, Mars and desire. Uh, well, I, I was always sort of caught by um, Bailey's comment, uh, desire fulfilled reals, reveals the dimensions of one's prison cell of uh, consciousness, its bars and its wall. Uh, once you've fulfilled desire, you realize uh, if it's actually, full, you think it's fulfilled, <laughs> then what else, what, what's next? So you have to just make a decision where you're going. Mars and thinking. I'd like to sort of read through this a bit because I, this is a, uh, I hope you forgive my sort of Martian language in some of this um, because I, <laughs> I, I found over the years that I actually have to tell people when I'm being sarcastic. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> It, it took me a long time to realize that. But at any rate, for the sake of, uh, of Mars context, and uh, this is Sagittarius, Aries, Scorpio, Cancer particularly, uh, is thinking in oneself and one's clients, 
thinking as a solar life? Is it thinking as the focused light of life? Is it thinking as a beam of light and illumination consciously projected into the planes of one's environment? Is it formless in nature? Is it a formless form dialogue? Is it our abstract and archetypic? Is it symbolic and metaphoric? Is it global systemic? Is it analytic of causality? Is it analytical uh, lo lo in terms of logic? In that case, then you have to study logical fallacies. Uh, you have to make that a topic of uh, study. Based on, is it based on analysis of principles? Is it conceptual in nature? If it's conceptual in nature, then you have to study conceptual biases uh, you know, to, nice, to train your mind uh, optimally in a, in a way. Uh, is it simple conceptual give and take? Is it worldly practical and systematic uh, strategy, log logistics, tactics. Is it an automat choice? You know, go to the automat and choose uh, your traditional hand-me-down data or uh, information and chat. Is it a type of common monastic attitude excretion chat? Excuse me, but that's how I see it and experience it uh, quite often. Is it turgid and confused, immersed in the five poisons posited by Buddhist philosophy? AAB, uh, Alice and uh, DK suggest the last. As they mentioned, the mass of humanity still th thinks on the seventh monastic subplane, uh, relying on a jolt of conflict to attempt the thinking process or to stimulate the thinking process. So these are, these are serious, I, I think very serious issues in terms of being able to assess uh, where a person's focus is, uh, where their state of development is. I know that esoteric astrology is based on the science of intuition and self, uh, self applied, uh, I mean, uh, self applied initiation uh, and challenge, uh, and that standard psychology is developmental in any number of ways. Uh, it discusses it in ten schools developmentally, but uh, that's in the conventional world of the trigon. The trigon for me uh, represent is a symbol for the sun. The eye of the sun is in the center of it, and. Uh, many symbols. Uh, Saturn is the permanent atom of the sun, the actual physical permanent atom. Jupiter conveys the forces of the sun, threefold forces through the sun. So Jupiter, the trigon I find in charts of people who are uh, deeply connected to the uh, established uh, status quo, or people who have enormous capacity to do that. Uh, they may choose to or not they may have an impact without understanding that they have. I see that in, in charts. Um, so here, what you need to ask, I think we need to ask is, is, is it the thinker in the causal body uh, is thinking, think, uh, which would be related to the sun, uh, say, identified with Vulcan and Mercury. Is it ideation as light or booty? That would be Mercury. Is it pure abstract thought? Manas booty, which is Mercury. Is it Manas, Mercury, and Venus? Is it soul, the son of mind, the higher mind, that's also Mercury, Venus? M Venus with a tinge of Mercury. Uh, common monastic, that involves all three, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. Is it lower mind purely? Uh, instinctive, unthinking, verbal, physical reaction, Mars. That's, uh, so Mars and anger and rage, I thought I should uh, cover this a little bit. Uh, the term anger, as distinct from hatred in Tibetan, is yidni dewa, which means something like non-joyful mind, non-ecstatic mind, uh, uh, that being taken for granted, evidently, uh, in some communities. And uh, it means also frustration or intense dissatisfaction. So that can come from obstruction of desire. It depends on where your personality is blocked or focused. And on the other hand, uh, Gurdjieff once observed, if Dissatisfaction and ex exasperation is absolutely total and experience with everything. Uh, perhaps that's a good start, uh, especially if you have a yoga philosophy or a spirit, a spirit gravitating towards isolute, uh, isolated unity or a spiritual path. Uh, that total, it's, it would be Krishnamurti's flame of discontent. Nothing, nothing will satisfy. And also, what is the point of coming to any conclusion? Because it's just a verbal formulation, it's a narrative. Uh, in your mind, it's not necessarily true. What's true is the flame of discontent that, for, that 
it drives us. It's, it's in a way it's associated deeply with Mars and Neptune. Uh, it drives us to a continually ask questions. It's the instinct of inquiry, which is is distinctly human, I think. Well, so, when Mars is at work, possibilities of unwitting, un unwittingly defeating oneself are pretty much endless. Uh, we don't want inherited thinking. We want to think for ourselves, etc. So, this is these are all Mars, and they they sort of yeah. I'll I can. Seven minutes? Okay, good. In terms of the Mars helicosm, it's, it's very interesting. It has a 40-year cycle. Uh, Venus has an eight-year cycle, a four- and eight-year cycle. But it, Mars returns to the same uh, position, more or less, within a few degrees, every 40 years. So it's a great way of uh, what I call the book, actually, um, Mars heliocosm transits. I didn't feel, feel like it was important to understand the heliocosm in terms of a diary. Maybe it would be, but I think the transits are useful because if you put the transits in your chart, you'll see when you're going to be uh, faced with challenges. Uh, character and quality. Self-possession and presentation through conflict and crisis. So the Mars... Uh, Heliocosm conjunctions, I use an empty square. Uh, when Mars conjuncts the Sun, it's on the other side of the Sun from the Earth, from our perspective. The Mars heliocosm opposition, a black square. When it's opposition the Sun, it's on the same side of the Sun as Earth, but outside, you know, outside the orbit is the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So it's much, much closer to the Earth. Well, here, some interesting cor correspondences, I guess. Back in 1972, that relates to this year, through Virgo, 13 and 14 Virgo. Mars now is in retrograde. A lot of people prefer to look at the Mars retrograde. I prefer to look at Mars, what I call extended tendency. Half of those retrograde periods will be entirely in one sign. Half of them will be in one sign and another in different proportions. So we have six months of it purely in Virgo, and I think that it's uh, it's it's capable of stressing almost anyone out, except uh, unless it's put to use. I'm particularly sensitive to it because of my position, but my Mars Moon position. But uh, if I don't use the Mars energy, which I have twice as much of, uh, I nervous energy basically, uh, then I'm I'm looking for trouble and. I think it's true of almost anyone. People will respond to Virgo in, in very similar ways. It, right, the direct. I know, and that's the thing I never pay attention to. I have a friend who really, he will not do anything if Mars is retrograde. It, it really, it destroys all his efforts, and I'm not sure why that is. But, you know, we are incredibly diverse in terms of our makeup and how we respond to things. Um, the I add uh, planetary nodes and, heli and perihelions. Now, uh, is everyone familiar with planetary nodes, more or less? Uh, it's the orbit of the planet, uh, and it's uh, it's the axial coordinates of the uh, planet and its nodes. It's uh, the perihelion of Phelion is the points are the points uh, closest and farthest away in the or in an elliptical orbit. So you find, uh, say, with Mercury and Venus, uh, Mercury and uh, Mars. I'm sorry, they're in Taurus, Scorpio. Uh, the perihelions are Neptune and Pluto. Uh, the nodes of uh, Venus, Uranus, are in Gemini. The uh, perihelion of Mercury is in Gemini. So you have a the Venus Uranus tri a triangle with the Earth of group consciousness is related to Mercury's closest approach to the Sun. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto as nodes are related to Saturn and the Earth. So you have the trigon and Pluto uh, in Cancer. 
related to Saturn and the Earth, the personality rule over the Earth. Uh, Neptune is related to Venus through Leo. Node to he, uh, perihelion. Now, uh, nodes take about 3,000 years, I guess, to uh, go through uh, a sign. Uh, the perihelia take about 2,000 years. Uh, the nodes are the orbits of the planet, as with the lunar nodes, and they express forward motion, just pure and simple. Planetary perihelia and aphelia, uh, they're the points closest to the sun in a planet's elliptical, egg-shaped orbit, and they represent spiral forward uh, motion. So it's a forward motion that's uh, conditioned by wobbling and wa uh, wavering. So here are the, um, so if you were to look at perihelions and aphelions, which now I'm putting into my charts, um, if you find that uh, someone's planet is close to the closest approach Mars makes to the Earth, then to me that has some, me some sort of meaning. The same with Mercury and Venus and the rest of the planets. So I'm just putting them into all my charts now just to see how much I can get out of it. Uh, and what I've seen just from the very beginning seems quite stunning. So I'm, I'm very happy to continue scribbling in hundreds of little <laughs> details into the chart that are very painful and time consuming. Here, the Mars Helicosm, the conjunction, the positive one, that usually, oh, this is something I haven't mentioned. The, the, the positive Helicosm, uh, both of these in terms of heli perihelia are on the Gemini Sagittarius axis, so the, er, the human axis. Uh, the Mars Helic, the positive Helicosm, Gemini moves towards Libra, actually towards Virgo here. Uh, the negative Mars Helicosm that usually produces crises of various types when it's closest to the Sun uh, moves from Sagittarius towards Pisces. So the, these um, models that Bailey handed out, I'm having more and more respect for on page 333 of Esoteric Astrology. Gemini moves towards Libra. Libra unites the two in Gemini. These are also associated with the seven paths and any number of other things with the, the Buddhas of activity and the three levels of the mind. All these, they're an enormous number of, yeah, I'm, I'm done pretty much, except Sagittarius, the disciple, becomes the savior in Pisces. And Sagittarius, we know, is the glorification of the path, of the spiritual path, ultimately. That's it, I guess. This is the book, right? Yes. This is the book. Yes, yeah, that's the book. Yes. Yes, and available in the bookstore. Yes, it will be there. Okay, and and of course it's filled with Mercurian detail, as you can, <laughs> as you can see. But it, it deserves a more careful pondering. So thank you for introducing to us to these ideas. Thank you. I try to condense them. Not, yeah. Yes. That's my approach. I'm yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Of course. So I think we all can, do. They gave me meditated on it. Yes. Yeah. Instead of yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.